Defining functions, one of the most important things you will do in this class. Before I talk about the details of defining functions, let's just take a moment to appreciate this moment. So, I told you on the first day that this course is all about abstraction, and today we're learning tools for abstraction. So, assignment is a simple means of abstraction because you can bind names to values. And of course, abstraction is the process of taking something complex, giving it a name, and treating it as a whole without worrying about all of its details. So function definition is a more powerful means of abstraction, because you'll be binding a name not just to a simple value, but to a whole expression, or statement, or a series of statements. Something that truly is complex, we give it a name and treat it as a whole without worrying about its details. So, the functions we'll define today are very simple, but they'll get more complicated soon. The way we define a function is with a def statement, which looks like this. So this is a generic version. You write def, that's a keyword in Python. Then you give the function a name, and you list its formal parameters, which are going to be names that refer to the argument values passed into the function. Then, a colon, indent the next line, and write the body of the function, which in the simplest case is just return, and then a return expression that gets evaluated every time the function is called. This top line between the def and the colon is called the function signature, and its most important role is that it tells you how many arguments a function takes by listing out the formal parameters, each of which will get bound to an argument value. We'll see exactly how that works in a minute. And then the function body is everything that's indented after the first line, and that defines what the function does. So it's a, in its simplest form, it's just a return keyword followed by a return expression, and an expression describes a computational process which will get evaluated every time the function is called. Okay, so this def statement is a two-line statement that defines a new function. There's a procedure for evaluating a def statement. So here's the execution procedure. First thing is that every time there's a def statement, we create a new function. And that function has the signature given on the first line. The second thing is, that we set the body of that function, which is the code that actually gets executed, to be everything indented after the first line. Finally, we bind the name given to the function to that new function we created in the current frame of our environment. Remember those frames? We'll be talking a lot about those. Okay, so here's the execution procedure for def statements. It's always the same. The most important piece is here. Number two says that we set the body of the function to be everything indented after the first line. It does not say that we actually execute that body. So that means when that def statement is executed for def square x return mul xx, no multiplying actually happens. The body just gets squirreled away as part of the function without actually getting executed until the function is called. Squirreled means to hide in a safe place. It's also the longest word in the English language that has only one syllable. Squirreled. Okay. I like, I like squirrel. Um, okay. Now. Functions are only useful because we can call them. So in addition to having an execution procedure for a def statement that creates the function, we also have a procedure for evaluating a call expression that uses a user-defined function. So here's the procedure for calling or applying a user-defined function. We add a local frame forming a new environment. We bind the function's formal parameters to its arguments 
in that frame. And finally, we execute the body of the function in that new environment. Let's see that in action before I confuse you anymore. Okay, from operator import mol, define square x to be return mol x x, and then we'll square negative 2. So we have a dev statement, and then we have a call expression that uses our user defined function. The first thing that happens is that we bind mol to the built in function, then we define square which does all three things I said. It creates a new function where the signature is the one that I wrote down in the def statement. It scrolls away the body of that function as part of the function that we created. So we don't show it in the environment diagram, but it's there. Every time we call this function, we're going to execute that body. But we haven't multiplied anything together yet. We haven't executed the body yet. Because the next line to execute will finally be the call expression that actually uses this thing. But we did bind the name square to the function that we created in the current environment. That's part of what happens when you def square x. Okay, finally, we're going to square negative 2. So we evaluate square, that is that function, we evaluate negative 2 is negative 2, and then we apply this function to the argument value negative 2, which means we follow the next three-step procedure, which is introduce a new frame, bind the formal parameters to the argument values, in that new frame, and then execute the body of the function in this new environment, where x means negative 2, square still means the square function, and mul still means multiply. So the next line to execute will be the return statement of this function. When we execute that, we find that the return value of the function is 4, which is what happens when you multiply negative 2 and negative 2. And then we're done. Back to the slides. What exactly happened there? So here's a screenshot of exactly what you just saw, and I'm just going to annotate some parts that are important. So we have a built-in function, we have a user-defined function. They look basically the same, except for in the user-defined function we actually see the formal parameter, x, because we're going to need to use it. We have a local frame that was introduced in the first step of the procedure above. The original name of the function is used to label that local frame, just so we can keep track. This label isn't really that important. What is important is that we have a binding between the formal parameter x, which is the name of the argument, to the value of the argument. The argument value is negative 2. And then we also show return values in these frames just so we can see what happened in the process of evaluating this function. So the return value is 4. This is not the standard name value binding, this is just an annotation in the environment diagram that tells us what happened. Okay, so that's everything in the picture. Now, I mentioned that a function signature is important. It's important because it contains all of the information needed to create this local frame that we built right here. So the signatures between the def and the colon in the def statement first line, we copy it over here when we create the function because the square here lets us name the local frame and the x is the name that we bind to the argument value of the function. So that's why the function signature is important as it tells us how to construct this frame every time we call square. Okay, we now know most of the story for user-defined functions, but there's one more big piece, and that's looking up names in environments. So every expression that we evaluate is evaluated in the context of an environment. Why is that? Environments are the memory that keeps track of the correspondence between names and values. 
so the environment knows what names meet. The current environment so far is really just either one global frame, or now that we have user-defined functions, it could be a local frame followed by the global frame. So these are the only two possibilities so far, it is a one-frame environment or a two-frame environment. Notice the word followed indicates that there's an order here. So here's the two most important things I will say all day. One, an environment is a sequence of frames. A frame is a binding between names and values, one of the boxes in the environment diagram. An environment is a sequence of these, which could be the local frame followed by the global frame. A name, when evaluated, evaluates to the value bound to that name in the earliest frame of the current environment in which that name is found. So if an environment consists of a sequence of frames, and I want to look up what does a name mean in that environment, I check each frame in turn. For example, to look up some name in the body of the square function, we look for that name in the local frame first. If it's there, we know its value. Otherwise, then we look for it in the global frame, because that's the next frame in the environment. And built-in names like max are in the global frame too, even if we don't show them. We just don't show them because we want to keep our environment diagrams simple. Okay, I'll start up Python. I'll define, well first I'm going to from operator import mole, I can multiply stuff. I'm now going to define the square function. I already used x, so why don't I use something else? Like square. Returns the multiplication of square and square. What have I done? I've used the name square. So square refers to some function called square, where squaring has a formal parameter square. So what happens when I actually try to square something? Well, it works just fine. Why did that work? Let's take a look. Okay, so here is uh, from operator import mole, def square square, return mole square square, square negative two. Visualize. The first line's okay. The second line defines a function called square with formal parameter square. Nothing has been multiplied yet, so no disasters have occurred. When I actually call the square function, I look up this function, I name it the local frame square, and then I bind the argument negative 2 to the name square, which is the formal parameter. Then I return mol square square, well mol is mol. The important thing is that square in this environment means something different than it used to. Now it means negative 2, because the first thing I do is I look up square here, and I found it, so I never actually look up square in the global frame.